Today, we're uncovering the blueprint for creating a team culture that thrives on open communication, collaboration, and mutual support. I want you to imagine for a second a sales team where every member feels heard, they feel supported, and mostly empowered to share their ideas with each other. It all starts with setting clear expectations for communication. So stay tuned as we break down the essential steps for every sales manager and what they need to know to foster a positive and productive work environment. Let's get started. Creating a team culture that prioritizes open communication, collaboration, mutual support, it's absolutely essential that every sales manager keeps this in mind. It's got to be in your toolbox. And you're going to need to want to foster a positive, productive work environment. Think about that. Why not? What other kind of environment do you think a sales team's going to thrive in? So with all that in mind, let me walk you through how to do that. Let me provide you a step-by-step -step guide on how Results-driven sales managers can build such an amazing culture. So first, let's start by taking this action. Begin by clearly defining what effective communication within your team is. What are the ground rules? What are the rules of engagement? Think about that for a little bit. Establish these guidelines that promote openness, transparency, respect, collaboration, and then have a collaborative discussion with your sales team and have them decide and buy in and design what these communication expectations are so that moving forward during team meetings, one-on-ones, et cetera, that it's in their handbook, that it's in their onboarding material that it's in your culture. Because the, the impact of this, the impact of you setting these standards creates a baseline for behavior and interactions. And I can't tell you how many times I come across a sales team that is just, they're the wild, wild west. And they don't think about the impact of their attitudes and words and responses. But if they're aware of what the standards are and you're enforcing those standards, you eliminate that potential threat to morale and confidence, et cetera, infighting, drama from occurring to the rest of the team. So make sure you get it established. The sales team is part of determining what that is. Agree on it. And then it's up to you as their leader to enforce it, continually enforce it under a culture of a continuous improvement. How can we continue to get better? Making sure based on previous shows and trainings that you're rewarding people when you see them doing a great job of this, including the whole team. It's a crucial task to get this started for any sales manager, especially ones who want to enhance performance. And that's what you're paid for. You want to get every dollar of performance you can out of your sales team. And the byproduct of doing it this way is you're creating this collaborative environment. When this works, it is an amazing tool for you to have. So let me start giving you the steps of how to create these guidelines. Now, the opening question, action you need to state is, what does effective communication mean to you, team members? And help them clearly define what constitutes effective communication in the context of, their, of the sales team. Have them consider aspects like clarity, consistency, timeliness, respect again in all communications. What are the rules of engagement? And it's super important to identify and articulate the specific communication behaviors that support a productive and positive environment. Write those down, capture those, put them on the wall. This is the basis of all this. 
And this might also include expectations such as how to deliver constructive feedback to each other, how they expect you to deliver constructive feedback. And we're going to talk about how to create a culture that they're willing to do that with you. They're willing to be open and transparent and honest with you in just a few minutes. Talk about the importance of the cadence of meetings. Not only what goes on in those meetings, but how often should we be having them? What do they expect to get out of these meetings? What are the appropriate channels for different types of communication? What should be a phone call? What should be an email? What should be a Slack or Teams message? I got to tell you, I, I constantly see people getting themselves in trouble trying to have discussions and maybe even arguments through Slack. That's bad mojo. So don't do it. Make sure your team knows when they need to pop up, go talk to somebody, get on a virtual call, make a phone call, do it in person, or Slack it. It's very efficient that way. But be careful the types of discussion you're approving for that. Then you want to, in the next step, develop and document communication guidelines. Once you define effective communication for your team, the next step is let's formalize these guidelines. Document the rules. Get them into your handbook. Get them into your onboarding methodology so that you've got a clear reference point for everyone, all team members, new and existing, and make sure it's easily accessible. Talk about it on a regular basis. Refer back to it when somebody's doing well. Refer back to it when somebody's abusing the rules. So make sure you've got a, a section in your handbook that outlines these documented communication guidelines. Third step, you need to communicate expectations very clearly and most importantly, regularly. What gets talked about gets improved. What gets talked about gets improved. So you've got to keep that in mind. So as you introduce and discuss these communication guidelines, emphasize their importance and how they contribute to the success of the team. Ensure that new hires are walked through those guidelines, that you're pointing it out to them, you're role-playing with them, so they clearly understand what these guidelines are. Do not dismiss that. You'll be shocked at how somebody will nod their head that they understand. And they may partially, but they don't entirely. Let's keep them out of trouble by clearly communicating the expectations. And then use your team meetings to role play scenarios that demonstrate both effective and ineffective communication with each other, with you, other departments, et cetera, especially with clients customers, prospects. This not only makes these guidelines more relatable, but it'll also help to reinforce the learning, encourage questions, open up discussions, clarify any doubts that they have, and ensure everyone understands what's expected of them. It's the single most important thing you as a leader has to make sure is a foundational element Everybody understands what's expected of them. It's crucial. Then, in your fourth step, you want to reinforce and personally model these guidelines. You've got to walk the talk. As a leader, it's absolutely crucial to model the communication behaviors. You cannot overstep your bounds, abuse the rules. You've got to be the person who regularly demonstrates all the behaviors that everybody's agreed during interactions. And then once again, recognize and commend team members who exemplify the excellent communication practices, making them kind of the role models for everybody else to follow. They've got you to follow and they've got some peers to follow. They're exceptional at it. And making sure, once again, that you're acknowledging instances where effective communication, especially in the beginning, is being displayed, being demonstrated, so that you can reinforce the behavior you seek, reward the behavior you seek. And number five, 
You want to monitor and provide feedback. This has got to be something that you keep in mind as a fundamental element of your leadership style, of your management expectations. You're continuously monitoring. You, you cannot let anybody step out of line on this. You do not understand a bad day. It's not acceptable. You're going to have to monitor, give feedback, how your team members are maybe overstepping the bounds, certainly how they're properly displaying the bounds. And listen, if you need to do some developmental feedback on somebody that who's doesn't quite have it dialed in, address that in your any deviations in your one-on-ones with them on a monthly basis. The sooner you point it out to them, the more likely you are to prevent this bad habit or behavior from taking root and becoming a common issue with them. Anytime communication breakdowns occur, refer back to the guidelines. That's your anchor. And then continuously encourage team members to reflect on those guidelines and how they personally can seek ways to improve. Those are the four steps of that. Now, here's an overall impact of being able to get that established implement and enforce that because once you've clearly defined and consistently enforce communication standards as a sales leader you have no idea until you've done this you will significantly enhance the team's overall effectiveness and certainly efficiency you'll be amazed at how much easier your job gets and how much better everybody gets along they know what the ground rules are there's no unfairness involved in what they do from day to day. And everybody's doing it the right way. Catch them doing it right. These clear communication guidelines remove any ambiguity, which in turn reduces errors and misunderstandings. They know what's expected of them. And furthermore, prompting an open and transparent communication culture ensures that all team members feel heard. That's one of the key essentials to leading a great sales team is they've got an avenue to be heard. They feel like you and others are listening to them and it's being valued. This contributes to much higher job satisfaction and for sure better team cohesion. The respect and trust that it gains in you and the respect and trust it gains with them and each other Super valuable. And these efforts, collectively, they foster this environment where every single team member knows how to communicate, is communicating, they're being effective. This all leads to improved performance. Seems almost too easy, doesn't it? And it is. But I rarely come across sales teams that do even a little bit of a job of this much less a good job. But the best teams, they've got this dialed in. That leader is walking the talk, enforcing the expectations, and everybody clearly understands how we're supposed to be doing it. Then let's make sure that you're having regular team meetings. I'm telling you, just it's one of the most common, consistent things that I find when I've, I've get brought in to help turn around an ineffective sales team? Or how often are you meeting? Eh, we really don't have meetings. Really? You don't have meetings? Like once a month, you're having meetings? No, we never have meetings. I just talked to a, a team this week. My meet and greet with them. They, they've never had a sales meeting. Much less the sales leader who we're replacing much less the sales leader sitting down and having a monthly coaching session with them, giving them updates on how they're doing. Much less updates and sharing new products, new tools, rewards, challenges, walk, talking through challenges as a team. But once that gets implemented, you're starting to get this buy-in, this teamwork this accountability that doesn't exist. And that's one of the nucleuses. That's one of the very important first steps that 
any sales team leader has to have in place. And you want to use this time, this regular team meetings. I strongly recommend a weekly team meeting and then a monthly meeting where we're talking about and recapping the previous month, setting goals for the next month, expectations, talking about the challenges, et cetera, as a group once a week for general topics or once a month for the broader and the planning and the rewards part of it. If you're having these regular team meetings, the impact is huge. It gives all your team members a voice. And when they feel like they can share their opinions, those opinions are respected. It fosters a sense of belonging and mutual respect, which is Another vital key element of effective teams in general, but certainly sales teams. It's a fundamental strategy. Fundamental, rudimentary. And to emphasize again, I'm shocked at how many times when I'm brought in to help turn around a sales team, it's common in every single one of them. They're not having meetings. And yeah, we're all busy, but if you make communication a, a big priority for you and you're doing it the right way, it's it's absolutely essential. Let me give you some, some ways how a sales manager can effectively organize and conduct these meetings in a way that's going to maximize the impact of them. So establish a regular meeting schedule. Friday at 10 o'clock, Monday at 2 o'clock. What? It's like a doctor's appointment. We schedule our days around that. And with this consistent schedule for team meetings and one-on-ones, it could be daily meetings. It could be bi-weekly meetings, depending on the needs of your team, what's going on, the pace of your operations. But get them scheduled, get them on the calendar, Get them respected, work our days around them. And as a leader, you cannot constantly be changing it. You've got to respect it like you expect them to respect it. Just decide on a team that works for everyone in general and then stick to it. Early in the week can be ideal for most settings. Fridays might be better for some wrap ups and reflections. You decide that, just have them. Anything's better than none. And then you need to, in the second step of this, create a structured agenda. I was never much of an agenda guy back in the day. But once I was coached and instructed and understood how valuable this was, I'd never go into a meeting without one. Before each meeting, you need to prepare your agenda and make sure everybody understands what we're going to talk about ahead of time. Have a central depository where that lives so that they can easily reference it. Send it out ahead of time if you need to, if you can't create the depository. So that everyone feels prepared. No one likes to be called on, called out, and be unprepared to talk about a topic. And in an open, transparent environment, you want to give them time to be able to plan what they want to come and talk about, whatever the issues are. And then from your standpoint, you want to make sure you're including time for updates, challenges, feedback, rewards, recognition, relevant discussion topics. Now, I want to talk about this real quick. Another big mistake I see sales leaders un just unknowingly make. And here's a, a simple topic that I'm going to base it on, but it could be any topic. Many sales managers avoid having one-on-one -on -one discussions around something that a sales team member is doing. Let's just say it's they're coming in late or they're staying too long for lunch. It's a time and attendance issue. And they take a very efficient approach in their mind of covering this one person's issue as a team issue. I just want everybody to know that being late to work is not okay and you got to show up for work. I've seen this blow up in so many sales managers' faces. Yeah, 
it's real easy and it, it allows you a little bit of padding between the issue and the impact of that issue. It keeps you from some confrontation potentially. But here's what happens in reality when you address one person or two person's issues with the entire team instead of directly with that one person or those two people. The people who are there on time, when you bring this up, are insulted. Like, where is this coming from? I never do that. Why is he talking to me about that? Why is she bringing this up? And I got to tell you, the person who's the offender or the persons who are an offender blows right by them. It must be everybody. Everybody's doing it. Everybody else's problem. When there are issues, specific issues with the person, take it right to them. Do not do it in a team setting. So just a warning, really valuable and important. Back to the topic. Some ideas, some specifics of what should be on your agenda. Sales targets, sales performance project updates, training sessions, any policy updates, trade show information, and also allocate some time for the team members to bring up their points. It's not the you show, it's the our show. And make sure you're given plenty of time for discussion. We're going to go into the hows and whys of, of how you facilitate meetings in a very effective manner, but if you start with agenda, you're well on your way. And then step three of all this is you wanna encourage open participation, like I've mentioned before, and you actively encourage every team member to contribute during the meeting, and you've got to use open-ended questions to get them to do that. Do you guys feel like that? Have you seen that? Anything, yes or no, in a broad general stroke? is going to be ineffective. But when you say, Harry, how's that been working for you? Jennifer, have you experienced that in the past? Elena, what do you what are your thoughts on that? Bill, what's going to go wrong with that? Name a name, open any question, get them into the pool of collective knowledge I talk about so much. And another thing and this I might get off track a little bit with this, but you may even consider rotating the facilitator. Allow your sales team members to run the meeting. Doesn't have to be you. Why would I want to do that? It gives them a sense of ownership. Gains buy-in. Drives confidence. And it also takes you off the pedestal and puts them on the pedestal. I'm telling you, when you do that, it's a kind of a secret weapon you get better participation. It's amazing. So use that technique like a round robin where each person takes a turn leading the meeting or even a round robin where every person takes turn speaking. Everybody has to participate. If you use open-ended question, use discovery type methodologies to, to get people involved, it works. You'll get much better information and participation. And then you want to, in step four, be able to have the toolbox and the ability to use the tools in that toolbox to facilitate constructive feedback. So it's okay to use part of the meeting to solicit and provide feedback. Oh, you thought it was going to be you giving them feedback? No, they're going to give you feedback. Yes. If you're open to feedback, you're setting the role model for them to be open to feedback. It needs to be done using your rules of engagement in a constructive, respective manner. But it also needs to focus on solutions, not just problems. Let's talk about solutions. Have them get bought into feedback. Get them talking. Number five. If there were any action items that we decided we were going to go work on, make sure that is included in your agenda. Best way to do that is conclude each meeting with a clear action item. What we're going to do between now and our next meeting. 
assign the task, the timeline for those tasks, smart goals, specific, measurable, agreed upon, person responsible, time bound, achievable, however you want to spell smart, and assign those tasks to either specific team members or agree that you're going to get it done by a specific deadline. Never leave it next week. It's got to be next Friday, 10 o'clock. Be very specific about that. And then when you come back to the next meeting, you have a part of the meeting agenda that talks about last week's agreements and what's gotten done. You can always share it in a digital platform, Monday, Aligned, whatever it is, whatever tool that you're using, that you share documents, the central repository. And the visibility helps keep everybody accountable, certainly you. And then on a regular basis, step number six is you want to make sure you're reviewing how things are going. Get their input on it and adapt to however we need to adapt. Periodically review the effectiveness of these meetings and let the team tell you how they're doing, not how you think it's going. It's up to the team. I got corrected on this once and it was a game changer for me. I thought I was giving great meetings. In fact, I wasn't. And that's when I went out and learned how to facilitate meetings at a high level. So regularly solicit feedback. Have them rate it, scale of one to five, maybe. Do impact of what's working really well, what's not working very well, what we need to adapt to, what we need to change. So do that on a regular basis. Adapt it. Keep working on it. Now, let me share some best practices for what I know effective meeting is there's efficient and effective we're going to talk about effective right now this gets it done you can enhance the productivity the inclusiveness the ownership of your meetings by adopting a few of these best practices i'm about to share it with you it's going to make your meetings much more engaging and much more participatory first rule this is the greatest rule when i learned it was uh, the three by 30 rule. It's a great approach. What does it mean? It's a facilitation format that makes your meetings much more dynamic and interactive. So the three by 30 rule means that every three minutes you stop and for 30 seconds engage a member of the audience, somebody in the room with you. Three minutes, 30 seconds, sometimes more, but it's just not you droning on about a topic. It's just not you having a one-way dialogue with everybody. It makes it engaging. It makes it a dialogue, not a monologue. So every three minutes, stop, pause, create a discussion, pose open-ended questions, direct it at different individuals, and by using this technique, it will help you maintain engagement and participation. And then you want to plan and practice. It's a big part of executing a great meeting. Before the meeting, prepare a list of all the open-ended questions until you, you commit this to habit. Think about some of the questions you want to ask, maybe even who you want to direct those questions to, and until you get into a really good habit of doing this. And you want to make sure you're directing your questions thoughtfully. Sometimes you want to intentionally direct questions at certain team members. Could be an influencer. Could be somebody that is being challenged at something. You want to get them to start saying it so the team can help them with it. You do this and it ensures that everyone has an opportunity to contribute. Everybody. 100%. And if you do this on a routine basis, you integrate this methodology of asking questions thoughtfully, getting them participating in it, you can turn these passive listeners, the ones that sit there doodling on their phone or whatever, allow that. Some people who just don't seem to ever get much out of these meetings, get them involved, get them in the pool. This inclusiveness will help balance out the participation 
And it's amazing. The quiet people sometimes have the most important things to say. And you would never know it unless you drew it out of them. It's up to you. But again, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about the importance of it being a dialogue, not a monologue. It's absolutely crucial. It's got to be interactive so that it keeps the team engaged. And in the end, it's going to enhance the quality, the ideas, the decision-making. That's what you want. You want ownership in there. So think about setting some expectations for interaction. Role play how that's going to work for you. At the start of the meeting, emphasize the importance of everyone's contributions. Maybe you want to open it up that way just to remind everybody until it becomes, again, their habits too. Use some of these facilitation techniques like three by 30, open-ended questions, including everybody in the room. And when you're making your meetings very interactive, it reinforces the value. You will have people wanting to come to these meetings because it's valuable to them. It's a valuable use of their time. And don't forget those quiet team members. Don't leave them out. If you ask them a yes or no question, that's a problem. It must be an open-ended question. Sarah, what are your thoughts? Sarah, how have you experienced this? Sarah, how do you do it? And then, again, one of the ground rules, maybe I should have talked about this earlier, is it needs to be a safe environment. Publicly acknowledge and appreciate contributions from all team members, especially your contrarians. We don't want a bunch of yes people working for us, sync events. You want to get people to speak up. Yes, you run the risk of that guy dominating a meeting with their opinion and their opinion is the only one that counts. Yeah, everybody has that person. I'll later tell you how to get that back in line. But if you're publicly acknowledging and appreciate everybody's contributions, that's going to build confidence like we talked about before. And more importantly, it's going to encourage future participation. Watch the body language. Watch their facial expressions. You'll see it change the more they participate. It'll come naturally, but it's up to you. And as things come up, I promise you, there's going to be things that irritate and annoy you, or it's the same ground you've been down a dozen times before, and you're sick of going down it. Please don't be condescending. Control your emotions. Control your personality. Control your drive. Be prepared for it. And just come across as the leader that you are. Not disrespectful. Because... An unsafe environment is one where team members do not feel comfortable. You want them to feel very comfortable sharing their thoughts. Their frustrations, yes, you want them complaining, but we also want solutions. As I've said many times, if they don't complain to you, who are they going to complain to? If they complain to you, are you more likely to be able to do something or explain it? Yeah. If you don't know about it, how can you fix what you don't know about you want to hear these things, either one-on-one -on -one or in a group, because especially if it's in a group, you'll see how broad the issue is. When everybody starts nodding their head and then contributing something to that problem and that complaint, you've got a bigger problem that you need to go work on. I've seen this happen in a positive way, and I'm just blown away by some of the things I've discovered through this safe kind of environment. In fact, I used to have a thousand salespeople I worked with somewhere around that on my team. I had a open standing meeting for any salesperson who wanted to attend a, a monthly conference call with me. And so anybody could sign up. And I, I typically had 20 or so there. It wasn't a huge, wasn't a huge room. Everybody was pretty busy, but those who felt like they had something to bring, sometimes managers appointed them to come. They wanted that person to be the spokesperson for their location. And I can tell you one time, one of the more quiet people that I've ever worked with, he was very effective. He was a really good salesperson, sales consultant with that company. He said, Vaughn, 
I'm really bothered by something. And he told me what was bothering him. Other people were agreeing. Yeah, that's a problem. That's a problem. But more importantly, Francis is his name. Francis says, here's what I've seen other companies do. I would like to know through our IT department how we could do this. Because I think it would help us sell more product. I was like, whoa, I wish I'd thought of that. Francis, great idea. I ran it up the chain. And everybody thought it was such a great idea. One that I never would have come up with probably on my own. Thank God Francis brought it up. Once we got it put into place, we tested it. And then making a long story short, it was a $500 million improvement in sales. His fix. Now, that's an extreme example. But if you're not following this course, these suggestions I'm making, you may be missing out on those kind of highly valuable ideas, thoughts. Started with a complaint, but it came with a solution too. So keep that in mind. This is a big tip. Be mindful of time, an hour. If it's an hour, keep it to an hour. If it starts at nine, it starts at nine. Not 9.05, we're not waiting on the person who's always late to show up. It starts at nine. If you go ahead and start, and this person is constantly walking in on a, in a, on a meeting that's started, it's, it might correct their bad behavior, especially if you were to pull them to the side and say, why are you always late? Just thinking. Start and end on time. So that takes some practice. It takes you and your facilitation skills. You can't let that guy, once again, hijack the meeting, take you off track, take you down roads that we don't have time for today. Respect everybody's time. Encourage punctuality. And at the end of the meeting, about five minutes before it's supposed to end, stop it. Keep a timer around. Stop it. And then give a summary of the key points that have that have come up during this meeting. It's an even better practice to go around the table or the room and ask what the key points based on everybody who participated, what their takeaways were. Great best practice. And I want you as a sales manager to think long and hard, come up with your plan and get it implemented. But the key to all of this is another one of those fundamentals. You've got to get really comfortable and change what your natural style is likely to be and how you ask questions. You've got to shift your style to being able to exclusively, for the most part, ask open-ended questions. Have strategic pauses. And after posing a question, call on someone, share their thoughts, or just live with the silence. Believe me, somebody's going to speak. Spread the discussion as far as you can using these open-ended questions, but use open-ended questions. And just to make sure we're all on the same page, let me give you some examples of what these questions, these open-ended important questions for participation, ideas, involvement sound like. Stan, how do you feel about the current strategies we're using? What changes might you suggest? That invites open or existing methods and suggestions for improvements. Gets involvement. Here's another one. Sally, can you share a recent customer interaction that challenged you and how you managed it? It's one of those great experiential responses and strategies that others may learn from, or others may be able to help Sally with it. Lou, what are some of the obstacles you're currently facing with your sales targets? And how can the team help you with that? That gets that team participation, creates brainstorming. Hey, in what ways, team, have you seen the market evolve? Stan, Sally, Lou? How can we adapt? Not can we adapt, how can we adapt? 
have you seen? In what ways have you seen? See how you open that up? You want to make sure it creates a, a response that's anything but yes or no. You get dialogue. You want to solicit these ideas for resources. Sometimes you'll get ideas around team efficiency. And I mentioned complaints and disagreements earlier. Let's talk about how to facilitate those because you want them. You want disagreements. Because if you don't know there's a disagreement, how are you going to be able to solve that disagreement? If you don't know there's complaints, how are you going to solve the complaint? Can't keep your head in the sand. Get it out there. Get it on the table. Be comfortable with that. So create an environment where complaints and disagreements can be openly addressed. Don't be offended by them. It's what they're thinking. It's what they're feeling. Do you not want to have some control over that? Do you not want to be aware of that? Do you not want to be able to redirect that? It's a crucial practice for any effective leader. Because once you leave that room, you want everybody marching to the same tune with the same commitment, with the same goals, or you don't want them leaving the tent. So this may seem a little counter to a positive environment, but stay with me here. When you're allowing your team members to voice their concerns and dissent, it may be just a misunderstanding, but that's their perception. You don't want them to continue with that perception because very often with that perception, you're going to get passive aggressiveness or noncompliance or lack of buy-in. That's the consequence of that. So I want to get it out. I want to know it's there. So here are some strategies for implementing this approach. Think about these. It may seem, again, counterintuitive to a positive environment, but think about it like this. Who do you want them to complain to? Each other? Well, that's a virus. You don't want that spread. It's the opposite of a positive mindset. And again, you can't fix what you don't know about. It prevents the virus from spreading. You can often change their perspective before it becomes an issue, before they start spreading the rumor. Fix it if you can. Explain it and why. But get it out there. Know about it. Settle it. Get them out of that mindset. Very often that opens up a dialogue track comes a very effective discussion. Some of your responses are, oh, gosh, I hear you, but how do you think we should be doing that differently? Oh, wow, I, I hadn't thought about it. How is that impacting you? How often are you encountering this? I, I encourage that one always because sometimes a one-off becomes a big deal in a salesperson's mind. And so they encountered it once and a thousand times. And by asking that question, you isolate it. And they understand at what level this is really affecting them. Humbles them a little bit without you being an a-hole. When was the last time this happened to you? I, I can tell you, I used to walk into stores and there'd be some salesperson, pretty regularly, frankly, who could run it up to me and say, Vaughn, we got this problem. Happens all the time. And I'd say, really? How's that impacting you? It prevents me from making sales. I lost a sale yesterday. Come out here and show me how this is happening. Show me what you're seeing. And very often they couldn't show me. It was a one-off. But if they were able to show me, we got it fixed on the spot. We didn't go to a committee. We got it solved. But if I didn't have that open dialogue with the thousand people that I worked with, I never would have known about how they were feeling or I wouldn't have been able to correct their feelings, their perceptions. So keep in mind transparency and trust. Include innovation and problem solving. You want to get those complaints out there so you're preventing any underlying resentment. You want to set clear expectations, establish those ground rules. Something I didn't mention, but I need to bring it up now, is active listening. You need to listen. You can't be defending, arguing, 
Yeah, budding with people. Get it out there. Be contemplative with it. Ask a mother open-ended questions. But most importantly, you need to pay full attention. Don't be dismissive. Don't be disrespectful of them. It's how they really feel. They may be wrong. Okay. Okay, let's hear it so that you know how they feel. And if there's conflict, you need to make sure you facilitate constructive conflict resolution when there's disagreements, and there often are. Facilitate a constructive dialogue that's generally from you being open-minded, not choosing sides. And each member needs to articulate their perspective and you having no perspective. It's hard. You don't want to go into any kind of conflict to resolve it with a bias. You need to open up your bias, hold your opinions loosely. Then collaborate with the members, the complainers, whatever the conflict is, get it resolved. And then you always want to be able to follow up, keep that in your toolbox. If you see somebody doing it really well, acknowledge it, appreciate their courage and what they're bringing up, you want to reward the behaviors you seek? It's a game changer, y'all. Think about it. Please start practicing this. Because the impact of having these regular meetings done the right way, you'll ensure that all team members are on the same page. Absolutely essential for a smooth operation. That your team meetings foster a culture of openness, I and respect and support which greatly enhances the team dynamics and performance, as I mentioned before. They also have a place or a platform for addressing issues. They can get their issues promptly dealt with. Gives them a place to celebrate successes together. It's ego boosting. You need to have an open door policy. You need to be collaborative we talked a lot about the group meeting today. There's also the need requirement of a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Most of the sales managers I work with, I encourage them to do it weekly. They find a lot of benefit in that. Yes, it takes a lot of time, but it prevents a lot of time wasting. It prevents a lot of bad behavior. It prevents a lot of, of unintended consequences. It can be 15 minutes, 30 minutes. doesn't have to be something super formal, but give them the venue of which to share ideas and thoughts and for you to be able to give them constructive feedback, personalized feedback, goal setting, tracking, coaching. Work with each salesperson to set realistic, measurable, challenging goals, but goals they're going to hit. Regularly help them update on how they're doing to those goals so that they're... They're, they've got a way to understand how they're tracking. And the more visible you can make their progress through a sales board, a dashboard, whatever, even better. Please, let's embrace this. Let's take away your key takeaways. Let's put them into practice and you can make this a game changer for your sales team. You'll love the outcome.